Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our event this evening. Thanks for taking time to be with us today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Jeff Kubiak. I'm a senior fellow here at the Center on the Future of War and a professor of practice in the School of Politics and Global Studies, where I co-direct an online MA in Global Security. This event is part of our Center on the Future of War speaker series. As many of you know, these events are normally held in person on the Tempe campus, but obviously the current situation has called for this minor modification. The good news is that our center friends from across the country can join us and hear some very interesting people talk about relevant contemporary security topics. We hope you can join us for more of these in the future. Again, welcome to everyone. I'd like to make one more note here before we get started. The Center on the Future of War and our DC-based think tank partner, New America, will present the 2020 uh, Future Security Forum online, September 21 through 24. Some of, the, uh, some of you are aware that this marquee event is normally scheduled to be an in-person event in the spring in Washington, DC. Uh, our spring event obviously had to be canceled this year and was rescheduled for this multi-day online event. As in all previous years, um, the topics are incredibly important. The list of speakers, very impressive. Please uh, sign up with the, center, with the Center for Email to stay abreast of the details of this and other upcoming events. Okay, so on with the, uh, on with the event. Uh, today's speaker needs a little introduction to most crowds interested in security. David Cocollin is a professor of practice in the School of Politics and Global Studies as well and teaches several courses in our online MA in Global Security. But of course, David is best known as one of the world's foremost authorities on counterinsurgency and counterterrorism and conflict in general. Among other jobs, David has served as the advisor and strategist for counterinsurgency and counterterrorism for the Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and was a key player in General David Petraeus' staff during the 2007 surge in Iraq. He has written some of the most influential books on the topics of counterinsurgency and counterterrorism, including Accidental Guerrilla, Counterinsurgency, Blood Year, and Out of the Mountains. His most recent book, too, will be a much cited and referred to core text on conflict in the modern era, The Dragons and the Snakes, How the West Learned to Fight the West, How the Rest Learned to Fight the West, David will open with a few comments before we go into a question and answer session. Uh, due to the size of the audience this evening, we will be fielding questions uh, after David's talk through the question and answer message function that you can access by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We are fortunate to have David here, uh, David on our team at the center and at ASU, and we're looking forward to his comments this evening and the follow-on discussion. David, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jeff. Um, thanks for having me. And uh, let me go ahead and, and share some slides. I am going to uh, abuse the privilege and, and uh, give you, you guys a bit of a slideshow, primarily because if you're not particularly familiar with the Crimea campaign, it's worth uh, getting the visual to remind you. Um, this is an extract from the Russia chapter in the book that Jeff mentioned, uh, The Dragons and the Snakes, which is a book about uh, military adaptation, basically. And it takes a bunch of ideas from evolutionary theory, ecology, anthropology, uh, to talk about how different actors that have been uh, outclassed by the West in traditional conventional warfare have figured out ways to invalidate that traditional Western conventional superiority. Um, and I, I did a lot of field work to uh, prep for the book, of course, um, being uh, a master of good timing. Uh, we released the book just before the COVID crisis hit. So uh, this has been a, uh, an interesting virtual book tour. Uh, but we're not going to talk about the whole book. We're just going to talk about um, Crimea and in particular, the idea of liminal warfare uh, using Crimea as a case study. It's worth just noting that hybrid adversaries like the Russians in this case, face a pretty challenging environment in confronting uh, Western conventional superiority. Uh, since the Cold War, the US and its NATO allies has basically had unbroken air superiority, but uh, at different times we've had the ability to apply only a limited weight of air power, uh, and we've often worked with less than capable local ground forces, and that creates loopholes for an adversary who can be modular or stealthy or blend into the environment. We also operate on extremely tight mostly self-imposed uh, legal and political constraints. We have extraordinarily good uh, electronic surveillance capability, but the volumes of traffic in a world that's now hyper-connected are so enormously huge 
that our analytical capability has often struggled to keep up with our ability to collect information. Um, most people now have smart handheld electronics, smartphones, GPS, and so on. And that gives adversaries a problem. Uh, it's very, very difficult to be clandestine or covert, but it also creates opportunities for uh, ambiguity. They're also operating in an urbanized environment where they can rely on a pretty high degree of technical skill from local populations. So that's the environment the Russians are dealing with. And this is just one example of its impact. This is a GRU or Russian military intelligence Spetsnaz team, special purpose force team in Ukraine. Uh, and you can see them po posing by their BRDM reconnaissance vehicle. They're out there doing classic unconventional warfare. How do we have this image? Well, it comes off the contactor, which is the Russian equivalent of Facebook. These guys posted a selfie uh, as part of the campaign and a group called Bellingcat very quickly, which is basically citizen journalists, very quickly pulled this off uh, Russian Facebook, identified every one of these individuals and geolocated where the photo was taken, thereby confirming uh, what the Russians were trying to deny at the time. So essentially this emphasizes the fact that in a modern warfare environment, it's just impossible to be completely secret. Luckily, if you can adopt what I'm gonna call the liminal warfare model, you don't actually need to be fully secret. Uh, this is from, uh, this is a translation of an article by uh, Valery Gerasimov, who's uh, the Russian uh, head of the general staff. And you'll notice that, and it's a bit of an eye chart, so I apologize, that it, it frames a conflict as having a sort of um, uh, a climb from below the threshold of detection up to over conflict or, or crisis, and then back down below to an environment where a more normal uh, situation obtains. And what he does in the article is to link the way that economic, political, military, diplomatic information measures can be used to, to provide a single integrated campaign uh, across that rise and fall of the arc of crisis. Just to simplify a little bit, um, when you think about a pyramid where there's a detection threshold, the point at which we identify that something is happening, an attribution threshold, the point at which we figure out who is doing it, and then a response threshold, which is the point where we're able to convince policymakers or allies or the Congress or whoever to take action in, re in, uh, in response. What a liminal warfare actor tries to do is stay in that liminal zone. They realize they're not gonna be clandestine. Uh, they realize they won't be able to stay completely hidden, but they wanna be ambiguous enough to achieve their objectives without triggering a response. And you can break that down into the traditional three-part uh, guerrilla auxiliary underground if you want. But a better way, I think, to think about it in the case of the Russians is, as Gerasimov lays out, as a cycle or a sequence through a campaign. So the key features of the campaign model that I'm going to describe here. First one is decisive shaping. The idea that the shaping phase of an operation before the first tank rolls or the first airstrike goes in is decisive. So that by the time the tanks roll, you've already won. And more importantly, enemy commanders don't realize they're in a conflict until it's too late. The next one is this idea of integrating all these different measures that Gerasimov talked about along a timeline that's driven by our decision processes, not our senses. People that run this kind of campaign are not trying to fool our intelligence systems. They're trying to confuse our decision makers. So disruptive ambiguity is a key part of uh, the approach. An idea that was originally uh, associated with Russian nuclear strategy has also become very important in this type of campaign. It's the idea of escalating to de-escalate. So at the beginning of the conflict, you move quickly, you seize your objectives, uh, you then hold something at risk, and then you begin de-escalating um, and trying to negotiate from a position of strength that prevents um, effective military action against you. Essentially, you're presenting your adversary with a fait accompli and then 
translating it into a military outcome or a, sorry, a political outcome through diplomatic means. This is my final theory slide and we'll get into the, the nuts of the, um, the actual uh, campaign. But if you think about that detection threshold, and this is just a, this, a simplified version of the triangle from before, essentially what you're doing is running a campaign that looks something like this. You start off below the threshold of detection, you rapidly spike uh, and achieve your objectives early in the campaign, and then you have what you might call a mission window to get done what you need to get done before the adversary can react. And then you wanna get back down below the detection threshold before they can respond. And essentially it's a little bit like one of those Hollywood heist movies where the bad guys uh, break into the bank vault and then they start the stopwatch and they say, okay, the cops are gonna be here in seven minutes. We've gotta get everything done before they arrive. So there's sort of a reaction time um, timeline, detection time, attribution time, decision time, how long it takes us to decide what to do, and then mounting and launching time for any reaction we might mount. The Russians have in particular focused very heavily on this idea of decision time, realizing that if they can obfuscate or delay a decision or make the uh, agreement around the decision a lot less, a lot harder to achieve, they can slow that reaction. And that allows a, a dramatically longer or a, a dramatically larger amount of space in the campaign to achieve what they're trying to do. So various actions across that sequence uh, essentially support that. Let me give you the Crimea example, and then uh, hopefully that'll make a lot of this theory a little bit more concrete. So as an overview of the campaign, in uh, November 2013, up until January 2014, the Russians had been engaged in a lot of shaping activity in Crimea and in Ukraine more broadly, in recognition of the fact that the Yanukovych government in uh, Crimea looked particularly shaky. It was experiencing internal unrest, uh, the Euromaidan protests, and uh, growing push for um, uh, integration with the EU or the West. On the, night of, on the day of the 21st of February, the Ukrainian government fell and Yanukovych fled to Russia. The next night uh, in the Kremlin, the Russians made the decision to go in. They were building on the back of months of shaping, but also on the fact that the Crimean Peninsula held a number of Russian bases and a significant number of Russian troops who were close to any objectives that they might want to seize. The morning after the decision to go in, suddenly widespread rioting and uprisings broke out across Crimea. Almost certainly uh, what we say astroturfed, right? So fake grassroots movements that were part of the shaping strategy that had been in place for several months. The next day, self-defense groups formed and the pro-Russian uh, political umbrella group that was working with these self-defense groups called for Russian intervention. Uh, so almost certainly unconventional warfare teams from Russian military intelligence were present. I'll show you some images of them in a minute. Uh, the day after the local groups called for Russian intervention, suddenly the so-called little green men or the polite people, as the Russians call them, uh, moved in and seized key locations across the Crimean Peninsula. They spent one day consolidating their position and then general purpose forces rolled in, that is armored vehicles, trucks and so on, to consolidate control. At the same moment, so this is the beginning, you've got the, the um, shaping phase and then an intense period of military activity over just about a week. Then the Russians kick out over to the decision period, trying to de-escalate, trying to shape the NATO uh, EU response. So the Kremlin begins to assure NATO no plans to stay in Crimea, nothing to see here, no annexation intended. It is just a humanitarian intervention at the request of Russian citizens in Ukraine and other people from Crimea. We're gonna be stabilizing the situation and then returning to barracks. For two weeks, Russia runs a campaign de-escalating the rhetoric. Simultaneously behind the scenes, Gerhard Schroeder, who is a former German chancellor, who works for Gazprom, the Russian oil company, 
is messaging the Germans. And Germany is obviously one of the key decision makers in the NATO decision about what to do. And the message is essentially, look, it is one of the coldest winters in European memory. You get 80% of your heating oil and gas for German homes from Russia. Do you really want to pick a fight with us right at the middle of winter? A lot of Germans could die as a result. Nothing then happens for, as I said, a couple of weeks. And then suddenly on the 18th of March, Russia holds an independence referendum. The next day they recognize Crimea as independent. The next day, uh, the Duma, the Russian parliament, approves a treaty annexing Crimea. And then Russia goes ahead on the 21st of March, exactly one month after the fall of the Yanukovych government and annexes Crimea. Now what you'll see in that one month campaign sequence is basically a week of heavy military activity, but building on the back of months of shaping, followed by two weeks of pure diplomacy and a little bit of behind the scenes uh, messaging, and then suddenly a diplomatic coup to seize uh, the province. So for those who don't remember the events, um, this is the Euromaidan uprising in February uh, of 2014 in the, uh, the Ukrainian capital, Kyiv. Nothing much happens initially, partly because Russia was trying to get the Sochi Winter Olympics out of the way uh, and sort of bank the international credibility that's derived from that before anything else happens. This is the grassroots, um, and of course in, uh, in English, uh, calling for Russia, help us, NATO, goodbye, uh, and a, a series of militia groups emerge around the same time calling for Russian humanitarian intervention. These are the so-called little green men or the polite people as the Russians call them. Uh, military or so army Spetsnaz on the left, uh, Russian Black Sea Fleet Spetsnaz on the right, moving in to seize key locations across the Crimean Peninsula after being called on to do so by the uh, unconventional warfare teams. This is a seizure of the Simferopol airport uh, by a team from the Black Sea Fleet. These are the same guys, uh, or actually a different unit, but the same uh, uh, function, uh, the, the Spetsnaz teams uh, belonging to a different division uh, under training. They are not like our special forces. They're much more like a combination of political warfare, information warfare, uh, and sort of a more conventional approach to to conflict, much more multi-purpose uh, type organization. This is General Purpose Forces, 810th Independent Naval Infantry Brigade from the Black Sea Fleet, moving in to reinforce and consolidate the positions that were seized by the Little Green Men uh, a few days before. Another uh, GPF reinforcement, uh, this is a seizure of the Paravani uh, military base uh, that happened uh, on the 9th of March, so in the middle of that diplomatic period, but in a fairly low profile fashion. On the right, you can see uh, actually, but all these people are members of the Vostok Battalion, so-called Yamadaevtsi in, in Russian. Uh, this is an interesting organization. It's an ambiguous force that is actually paid for by the Yamadaev brothers who are the owners of a Chechen television station, um, but offered as a sort of patriotic gesture to the Russian Federation and a way of Russia using what are effectively military actors, uh, but doing so without uh, state control or state uh, fingerprints on it. This is the rhetoric of escalate to de-escalate. So uh, 4th of March, middle of the de-escalation period, Putin meets with a bunch of uh, reporters, says Russia's got no intention of annexing Crimea. It's just humanitarian intervention. He says now Crimean tensions have been settled. Uh, it so happens that Russia mounted massive military maneuvers all around the border of Ukraine in the same time frame. Uh, Putin says this has had nothing to do with uh, what's going on in Crimea, previously scheduled, uh, uh, unrelated. Uh, they, by the way, Russia launches a top all intercontinental ballistic missile simultaneously with all of this, lands in, uh, in Kazakhstan. Uh, and nothing, none of this, of course, is intended to intimidate uh, the Ukrainians. Uh, a number of other messages that come out are essentially soothing messages during this period. 
uh, and the Russians at the same time claiming that Crimeans have the right to determine their future through a referendum um, and saying that anything they've done is in accordance with the 1994 treaty. This is the diplomatic um, channel. The back channel, Gerhard Schroeder talking to uh, Angela Merkel and other key players in the German government and in NATO saying, look guys, really, uh, whatever happens in, U in Ukraine or in Crimea, it's really not worth a fight with the Russians. And as a former German head of government, uh, he has a fair degree of uh, credibility with these people that he's talking to. 18th of March, um, one month after the, um, uh, sorry, in, in, in this sort of final week of the, of the campaign, um, Crimean leaders go to Moscow and sign with Putin the treaty um, annexing Crimea to Russia. There's still a little bit of cleanup that happens. This is a Spetsnaz team, uh, unconventional warfare guys and uh, Crimean militia seizing the Belbek Air Base, which was the last remaining Ukrainian government holdout after the uh, annexation. So this is four days after Russia has formally um, signed the annexation treaty. And almost immediately you have Russian sponsored militia arresting civilians across Crimea that may uh, be considered to be disloyal to the new organization. A Couple of years later, the full uh, consolidation is in place and by this point, uh, Crimea is honoring the little green men and there are now these little bronze statues to the little green men uh, in a couple of places in Crimea and Crimea is now fully uh, integrated into Russia. So some observations, use of integrated military, political, informational and economic means to achieve mostly non-military uh, objectives. They didn't seize Crimea through combat, they seized it in a diplomatic coup after a month of ambiguous operations and several months of shaping. Um, they created a bandwidth challenge for the Ukrainians and for NATO. So many things going on simultaneously in so many places, it was really hard to focus and figure out how to address them. They shaped decisively before, or indeed instead of combat operations. Uh, by the time the first armored vehicles rolled uh, in late February, the outcome was no longer in doubt. This is an example of the sort of new generation non-linear warfare that Gerasimov talked about in the article I spoke about at the beginning. There's a lot of military theory that plays into this and we can talk about that in Q&A if people want to do that. Uh, ambiguous or liminal rather than covert. No one had any real doubt who these people were, but they had no insignia and Russia persisted in just blatantly denying that they had anything to do with it uh, until the whole operation was in place diplomatic and back channel methods rather than military methods to secure the objectives, playing back at the West, rhetoric or norms like responsibility to protect humanitarian intervention uh, that um, were then able to neutralize uh, a NATO or a Western response. The response did come, but it came later, right? So NATO did its enhanced forward presence. Uh, this is Lithuania, but many countries in the Baltic have been practicing uh, resistance warfare and training against this kind of uh, potential operation by the Russians. Uh, the US and um, NATO and the EU have engaged in some pretty significant rewrites of their doctrine to think about how this might work. Uh, and this stuff's all available uh, for download if people are interested in, in taking a look at how this has shaped the way that we think about resistance and unconventional warfare. So on that, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna stop my sharing, and I'll throw it back to you to uh, do some Q and A there, Jeff. All right, great. So if you if you have a question you want uh, you want me to ask David, go ahead and type it up and in, in the uh, click on the Q and A at the bottom of your screen. It'll show up on a screen for me, and I'll, I'll work through it. But it, it, before we before we get to any of those, David, one of, some of those pictures were pretty amazing, actually, quite frankly, of troops, Russian, Russian forces in the, in the act of doing what they're doing. Are they all from social media essentially or all from, what, what's the source of all those images? There's a, there's a, there's a, a variety of these. Some of them, um, uh, the earlier ones are mostly social media. The later ones, there was actually quite a significant Ukrainian and European press, uh, well, Ukrainians are European, but uh, uh, 
like EU news agencies and others were uh, on the ground during that first week of the campaign. And then it dropped off dramatically. And one of the things the Russians did was actually attempt very heavily to control uh, the information flow out of Crimea during that sort of couple of weeks of de-escalation. So um, I'll get to, I have a couple other questions I wrote down that I'll, I'll get to here before too long, but we already have a couple on the queue. So I'm gonna get to those. One of the, one of the participants are, uh, has asked us, what does a similar move in Northern Kazakhstan look like? Are the Russians maneuvering in that direction? And what would that look like? So there's a, there's a whole series of areas around the Russian um, border. And actually, there's a Russian joke, which uh, Keir Giles, who's one of the best known Russia watchers in the UK, likes to repeat, which is that Russians believe that the only secure Russian border is one that has a Russian soldier standing on both sides of it. So the idea that you want to <laughs> penetrate into uh, sort of uh, territorial depth to create uh, sort of a buffer zone is a key element of, of Russian thinking. Uh, in northern Kazakhstan right now, I think it looks a, a little less like Crimea and a little more like the precursor to the, to the Georgian campaign in 2008, which I actually describe in great detail in the book. Uh, and I'll just point to a couple of things. One is the sort of passportization campaign, so-called. So Russians have really, Russian government has really picked up on this idea of a responsibility to protect and, uh, and also of the sort of claim of uh, humanitarian intervention to uh, protect Russian citizens. And so one of the things we saw in Crimea, we're seeing in Kazakhstan now, is uh, basically anybody that wants a Russian passport and speaks Russian and can claim any kind of connection with Russia will get one. They'll be issued it by the local consulate. And now what that basically does over time is create a community that gives a pretext right. for anything that uh, Russia might want to do. Yeah, that's a, that's an old trick of theirs. They've been doing that certainly in the in the near abroad since since after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Certainly since the turn of the millennia, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so what's the, what's the relationship between the kind of maneuvers and, and the and the operation that allowed for the annexation of Crimea and what's going on in in East Ukraine and Donbas and other re, other uh, regions of East Ukraine with Russian activity and where where is that? So while this was happening in Crimea. Uh, there weren't military moves in eastern Ukraine and Donbass and uh, that area, but there, there were the beginnings of the unconventional warfare period. So basically, the exact same sequence was followed in, in eastern Ukraine as was followed in Crimea, but just uh, a few weeks to months later. And um, people may be aware of Igor Gherkin, or otherwise known as Igor Strokov, uh, who was one of the uh, several Russian GRU operatives that were operating under ambiguous status in eastern Ukraine at the time. Unclear or at least unacknowledged whether he was working for the Kremlin or just doing things on his own, very much like the Little Green Men. And then you saw the emergence of self-defense groups, riots, conflict, a call by a uh, Donetsk People's Republic, for which was <clears throat> uh, brought into view by, by guys like Strokov to uh, call for Russian intervention for protection, and then a Russian move that brought in many of the same actors that I showed you here, the, the Vostok Battalion, uh, GRU, Spetsnaz, conventional troops uh, operating uh, without insignia and claiming not to be Russian military, uh, right. volunteers, right? and so very much the same sequence, just a few weeks later. Yeah, and Bellingcat's got a lot of details on that too. They've done a really nice analysis of the shoot down of the, <clears throat> of the airliner over, over Ukraine, um, MH17, so. Yeah. Uh, a couple of questions in the queue about, about basically about techniques or about methodologies, if you want one about psychological warfare uh, and the other one about cyber and where does cyber fit into all this? Yeah, so those are both great questions. Um, so the Russians define uh, cyber a little differently from how we do. And it's worth noting that the information troops of the Russian Federation have the ability to um, do things like um, fiber optic engineering, uh, take over an entire data center. They actually did that in Simferopol during the Crimea campaign. Uh, the second guys through the door behind the door kickers were information troops who essentially took down the entire fiber optic network and routed it through Moscow for a period before uh, standing it back up under Russian control. So a more sort of physical, technical capability than, um, than what we might consider to be information warfare. They also possess an extraordinary array of electromagnetic pulse weapons, non-nuclear weapons that can knock out uh, systems. So they, they see it as more integrated with kinetic activity than we do. Hmm. 
on the psychological side, it's worth mentioning that um, a lot of this stuff, uh, it, when we talk about psychological warfare or information operations as well, we tend to draw our thinking from um, sort of mad men era advertising executives in New York City. And it's about convincing people that we are the good guys, that they should support us. And the call to action is generally to acknowledge that, you know, what we're doing is the right thing and to, to get on board. That's not how the Russians operate. They run a technique called reflexive control, which I actually talk about in detail in the book, which is not about persuasion. It's about cognitive framing and about convincing an adversary to look over here at a particular shiny object instead of focusing over there or encourage us to frame the situation in a particular way. In this circumstance, the key Russian psychological issue was to get people to frame this as a Crimea issue, not a Ukraine issue. And the Crimea issue was the focus. And by the time people shifted their attention to what was going on in the rest of Ukraine, they'd already begun the covert invasion. They got them to see the old lady in that optical illusion instead of the uh, instead of the pretty young woman or whatever, right? right. That's, that's basically because if you prime and do all those sorts of things, you can get the cognitive right. whole, and, whole, societally, not just individually. Right. And, you know, we see this in American politics, right? Since the sort of Russia uh, influence in the 2016 election campaign, uh, the Russians haven't really had to do much lately because different parties in American politics have been arguing with each other about that issue. Right. at such high volume for multiple years that essentially they've, they've thrown it out there. It's often wor it's worth noting that you don't have to be covert. In fact, you don't actually want to be covert if your goal is to generate that kind of argument. You want to be uh, detected and then have this kind of argument about what the origins of that were. There's deliberate ambiguity. So one of the questions that was kind of eating me, and it kind of goes along the lines of some of what's in, in the question and answer queue too, is, okay, so that was six years ago, the, the case study you just, you just laid out for us. What's your assessment of where the U.S. and its allies <clears throat> uh, are today, both kind of operationally, tactically, you mentioned you saw the, you know, the deployment of forces and the change of doctrine, uh, but also strategically and decision-making and those sorts of things. What's, what's the state of play there? Um, my sense is it's worse in a lot of ways, but, but how and why, and, and where do you think it is? So the Russians did in fact have a number of defeats in the campaign in Ukraine that followed this. And you mentioned the shoot down of the Malaysian airliner. They had a number of really major mistakes that um, were, uh, that helped them to learn a lot of lessons. They also went into uh, Syria, as you may recall, in September, 2015. And ironically, the same unit that spearheaded the seizure of uh, key bases in, uh, in Crimea went into Syria in September mm -hmm. 2015. So they, le they learned a lot from that initial um, campaign and have been applying it elsewhere. Um, we most definitely learned from that. And I, I gave you a couple of references in terms of how our doctrines ad adapted and how um, we've changed our thinking on resistance warfare. The um, Europeans created a hybrid warfare center in Helsinki. Uh, the Swedish defense college has produced another resistance warfare manual that really focuses on understanding how to deal with this kind of threat in a mm -hmm. different way. And there's actually been a pretty significant uh, step up of um, Baltic states and Scandinavian states who are the frontline states in this case uh, to thinking about this kind of warfare. That's another presentation obviously, but uh, it, there's certainly a lot of learning that's gone on since. And I think if this were to be attempted again, uh, the Russians would probably find a much more alert and ready European uh, set of actors, not necessarily U.S. Yeah, and that's that's a good point too. And actually, one of the questions asked about about you know the translatable the translatable nature of this of this strategic approach to other parts of the world, not just not just you know the Russian near the so you know, former Soviet Union, the Russian near abroad, but also into Africa, the Middle East, and you mentioned Syria, and and, and maybe even Central America or Central Latin America. What is the transferability in, that, in, in those situations for this kind of approach? So we are seeing that. We're seeing Russian engagement in Africa in a number of places uh, and across the Middle East. We're also seeing significant Russian attempts to uh, influence the situation in Latin America. I would just point to uh, one key vulnerability here, which is that this type of operation is vulnerable to actually losing people because um, it's supposed to be deniable. And it's pretty hard to deny body. Uh oh. David, you're frozen. Unfortunate. Syria, 
where up to 300 members of the Wagner Group, which is a Russian uh, private military company that works a bit like the Vostok Battalion, were killed in air and artillery strikes by US forces when mm. they tried to pretend they weren't there. And they were relying on the belief that the US is constrained by various norms and uh, rules of behavior and that they can predict uh, you know, the edge to which they can walk up to. They miscalculated that and lost a lot of people in that one. Another example was in Northern Mozambique in Cabo Delgado province late last year, where the same organization, the Wagner Group, uh, went in to a situation of a new Islamist insurgency in the Northern province and uh, tried to say, look, the Americans are pussies, you know, step back, we're gonna do this and take care of it like we did in Syria. They got their asses kicked, lost a lot of people and pulled out within a month. So um, I think, you know, this is, but I would just say they're on a learning curve. They're getting better. And I'm seeing the, uh, the techniques that we saw in Crimea and Ukraine and elsewhere continually being refined. So it's not a static thing, right? It's evolving. Right. That's a good, that's a good point. And, and again, a couple of questions that kind of dealt with this too, that I think are really interesting. So um, we talked a little bit about, about counter moves, if you will, and the, the Russian losses. So some miscalculations clearly are possible as in any, in any kind of operation like this, but what are the other flaws or drawbacks of this approach? Do you think the Russians are either experiencing or that you see as a strategic thinker that you see in this approach that, that, you know, needs to kind of guide our way forward? So one of the problems is that, uh, for, for them is they don't actually have a lot of people that can carry out these kinds of operations. They've, they've got a limited capacity. Uh, and I think if you're trying to run this kind of strategy, uh, you pretty quickly run out of um, assets, right? The second problem is uh, illustrated by the, the airliner shoot down. If you're going to give um, a book for M missile to a, a gorilla that you don't <laughs> control, uh, you, be, you, you know, you, you, you better be ready for the consequences. Right. And, I think they lost hugely and they got kicked out of the G8, which is now the G7 as a result of that. Um, and I think that's, that's a problem for them. Uh, a third problem set is that, as I said, if you lose enough people, it's very hard. It may be possible to obfuscate this in the foreign media, but it's pretty hard to hide it from Russian parents. And I think uh, that's, there's a limit to how far you can carry this before in terms of casualties before it, it doesn't work for you anymore. Um, and then finally, I think, uh, this is kind of a bit, it's going to sound a bit weird, but these guys are used to dealing with people that have clear red lines, coalition decision-making processes that are public and uh, sort of a, a very public set of norms and, um, and ways of behaving. And that makes us very predictable. And when you get a mercurial leader, like say President Trump or somebody like um, uh, the, the, the French government who don't fuck around and negotiate and, spend a week arguing about what their responses are going to be, but just act immediately um, on, on certain things. Uh, or you get some of the Arab nations that do the same thing or Israel. Uh, this sort of stuff works against the coalition. It works against NATO, works against people who want to appear the good guys and, uh, and all that. It doesn't work so well when you're dealing with a, a more mercurial or uh, less public decision making process. Couple. Well, I got one tactical question. I think that uh, that you could probably answer quite easily. Is that what any insights of a particular particular skill set? You kind of mentioned it's a particular skill set of the little green men. What? Who are? I mean, what? What's the range? I guess because I'm sure there's a range. There is, and it, you know, there's not one type of actor here. But I think um, I'll point to a couple of archetypes. It's worth mentioning that in Russian um, practice, going back to before the Russian Revolution, but certainly through the entire Soviet period. Special operations is considered to be a subset of intelligence. So people that are right. special operators have already had pretty significant um, intelligence training, and that may include subversion, um, uh, information warfare, um, political, what they call political engineering, uh, a number of other techniques. And uh, th these are well known in the Russian uh, environment, but uh, it's worth pointing out that, you know, we think about the KGB or, um, today's FSB and SBR as kind of running around and doing James Bond stuff. Actually, the Russian military intelligence, GRU, does a lot more than our military intelligence organizations do. And most of it is not James Bond stuff. It's political subversion. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one element. The other thing is the Russians are not shy about launching one individual by himself and saying, 
do what you can. And if it succeeds, we'll support you. If it doesn't succeed, you're on your own. And this sort of ambiguous, um, you can see it in the use of cyber militias in the uh, invasion of Georgia in 2008. You can see it in uh, the way that Yevgeny Prigozhin, who uh, runs Wagner Group and does a number of other things, was behind this so-called internet research agency mm -hmm. that was involved in the, um, uh, the US election influence operation. There's no Russian government footprint, uh, fingerprints on that. And Vladimir Putin is on record saying, look, it's entirely possible that on their own initiative, patriotic Russian hackers just decided to do something that they thought was valuable. Um, that may be true, right? Um, so there's, there's a sort of a comfort with ambiguity, comfort in operating by yourself, uh, and a sort of multi-purpose individual who can do everything from running an assassination to standing up a guerrilla group to organizing a political party to, uh, you know, running a Twitter campaign. And it's just much more integrated uh, way of thinking about it than we do with, with a much more sort of stovepiped uh, approach. Get it. Good. Okay, so fast forward to, to 2020 and, um, up, you know, the unrest in uh, Belarus. Where is the Russian fingerprint there? Obviously, there aren't any, um, but <laughs> none, none that will be, we could trace back to them. What's the Russian? What's the Russian approach there in a in a really a, a kind of a similar but very different um, setting? So I actually want to come at this from the Russian perspective, right? Russia sees what's going on, and you can see this in Russian social media and Russian mainstream media, as well as in the uh, comments of official spokesmen. Russia sees what's happening in in uh, Belarus as a Western unconventional warfare attack and an attempt to carve out uh, Belarus from their sphere of influence using the same kinds of techniques that I just talked about. And it's worth mentioning that when Gerasimov was giving his talk and writing his articles in 2013, 2014, overtly he was talking about how we operate, right? And uh, in fact, there's a strong argument that it's actually an assessment of what Russia would like to be able to do based right. on their view of how we operate. Right. And, uh, you know, likewise, the Georgia campaign in 2008, they saw that as a blatantly uh, illegitimate attempt by the West to encircle Russia by bringing Georgia into NATO. Um, and that's how they saw Ukraine as well. So when Russians look at what's going on in Belarus, they see a color revolution sponsored by the US, manipulated by global media. Um, for, unrealistically, I think the Russians believe that for some bizarre reason the Trump uh, administration is in cahoots with CNN and uh, you know all these other people when it comes to Belarus even though they obviously hate each other back here in, in, in the States um, and there's a sort of belief that this sort of subversion campaign uh, promotion of a UN Maidan style uh, urban unrest and then provoking uh, Belarus to take action is going to be followed up by a conventional invasion from um, from the West. Some of this is just pure psychological um, projection, right? They've got a guilty mm -hmm. conscience about what they did in Ukraine and they think we're going to do the same thing to them. But also it's kind of tit for tat, right? This stuff goes right back to before the Soviet Union. And again, I talk about this in the book where, you know, Western leaders promised Gorbachev, black and white, NATO will not move one inch to the East if you guys pull the Russians out of Germany. And of course today, NATO is right on the Russian border. Uh, and the Belarus uh, incident is, or Belarus ongoing series of incidents is, is a reflection of the fact that Russia believes that NATO is encroaching onto its territory and threatening it. It believes it's taking a defensive approach here. Got it. Um, what, so this is the, 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 the delay, the this decision making time, that's kind of the key piece. You, you, you kind of set, focused on it at least at some level too. And, and you focus a lot at the kind of more or less operational, you know, very immediate crisis, crisis decision making of the, of the West and, and, uh, and NATO. What role does Russian reputation play in their ability to continue to use basically implausible deniability to keep that decision window open for as long as it is. So the, 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 I think the fundamental thing to realize here is that the Russians are not lying because they're just liars. It's part of the integrated campaign strategy that you have completely watertight political top cover uh, from Russian diplomatic and uh, political leaders while the consolidation and seizure phase is going on. The story can be changed uh, 
you know, retrospectively if need be, but in the moment, uh, implausible deniability is a great way of putting it. You know, the um, blatant ability to say, no, uh, you know, black is white, night is day, this is not happening. Who are you going to believe, you know, me or your lying eyes? That's the, that's the strategy. And it's, it's, uh, it's pretty impervious if you don't care if people think you're a liar, right? right. Um, and it's almost like shamelessness is, a, is an operational uh, capability in its own life. <laughs> Uh, that, that's a, the follow is a follow on question in the Q2 that I think is really interesting and, and goes along that line. So, so the question, I'm going to read this one verbatim so I don't get it wrong. What are the lessons for countries like the US and Australia that follow international rules based order? How do we react legitimately how, and how do we equip a con- uh, other countries um, to under threat to resist this? Yeah, so this is a great question. And I, and I think it's been exercising a lot of minds in, uh, in the West. And I think the military and diplomatic agencies and aid agencies have, I think, got a pretty good handle on this now. And I, I gave some brief examples. There's a conventional step up to uh, demonstrate intent uh, toward Russia. There's some diplomatic moves on our part to try to de-escalate the possibility of conflict over the very borderland between NATO and Russia. A lot of effort in uh, the Scandinavian country, countries and the Baltics to um, uh, get more comfortable, actually regain some of their Cold War expertise in dealing with this kind of subversion and other activity. There's also been efforts actually to share that knowledge in Latin America and Asia uh, in relation to China as, as well as Russia. So mm-hmm. um, recognizing that this isn't just a China, uh, just a Russia phenomenon. And then there's the um, uh, the changes in doctrine that we talked about. So a lot of this is, ha- is happening behind the scenes. Where I think we're weak is I still don't think, um, like nothing that I said in this presentation, it, it, like it's all old hat, everyone knows this, there's nothing new here mm-hmm. if you're talking to Scandinavians or people in the Baltics or Ukraine. Right. I hope that a lot of it wasn't new to this audience because we all look at this um, pretty regularly. I would say the average American, Brit or Australian news media consumer probably wouldn't know a lot of those details. And I think it's the public not being aware of how a lot of this goes that is, is a problem. And the other real problem I think for us is that in the less so in Australia, but in the UK, particularly European countries and the US, there's now a polarization about Russia. So that if you're on one side of politics, you've got an incentive to downplay the Russian threat. If you're on the other side, you've got an incentive to see Russians under the bed, you know, and right see a Russian under every rock, you know, and uh, I think the reality is somewhere in between. It is real. They're not 10 feet tall. Um, Not everyone who disagrees with you politically is a Russian asset, you know, Um, and I I think we have to sort of calm the hell down and, and try to realize that getting spun up about this and making these accusations uh, against each other. Any Ukrainians are very familiar with this because this is what the Russians have been deliberately creating in Ukraine. Right. Kind of division, reflexive control, right. Over the past, um, many years. And I think we're, we're victims of that as well. Yeah. Yeah. One of the questions I wanted to get to too, and it's a little, again, a little bit more ta- um, tactical operational at the, at the level of the actual um, operation. What's the level of um, cooperation amongst locals and what's the requirement for cooperation amongst locals for this sort of thing to take place? Clearly the, the operation you described Crimea, there, there were a significant number of ethnic Russians in that. Is that one of the requirements and, and, and do they play a fairly sizable role? Yeah. So three main population groups to think about in Crimea, the Crimean Tatars who had a, um, it's a Muslim minority, had a history of persecution under the Soviet Union, very wary about um, the um, return of Crimea to Russia. And they were a key target of Russian subversion, trying to create pro-Moscow elements within the Tatar community wasn't very effective. And then after the seizure, neutralizing them uh, pretty, pretty rapidly um, through a co-option, but also uh, intimidation strategy. Second was Russian speaking, Russian citizens within uh, Crimea. Many of them actually didn't support the intervention initially, but a lot of them were very happy when Russian troops turned up. And you can see, I, I, time didn't allow me to go through, but there's hundreds of photos of, um, you know, selfies. Heroes welcome. Yeah, yeah heroes welcome, mm-hmm. uh, flowers, cups of tea, partly because the Russians deliberately created an element of fear and chaos and crisis 
and then became the solution to their own problem that they created. So mm. people were super happy to see them, not necessarily because they were pro-Putin, but right. because they just lived through weeks of chaos and violence and people getting shot on the street and buildings burning. And, you know, it was a sort of a, um, almost like a protection racket. Yeah, we've seen that playbook before. Right. right. And then the final uh, group is, you know, Ukrainians. And of course, Ukraine was part of Russia until the 50s. And uh, Ukraine is the origin of Russian, or point of origin of Russian civilization. One of the things that we saw in uh, this campaign was significant subversion inside the Ukrainian military mm. and people changing sides, right. uh, having to be purged, a lot of intelligence penetration of the Ukrainian uh, forces. And then uh, you saw that play out. And the, as I mentioned, the, that last couple of bases that held out after the annexation, uh, eventually it was a sort of inside out job, side job in terms of them being uh, taken over by the Russians. So let's, I'm going to step this back. You know, I think your, your book's all about adaptability, right? How the, how right. the rest adapted to the kind of the Western um, you know, supremacy in, in a conventional fashion and trying to a- accomplish their objectives in other ways. That's the fundamental core of this. You are covering basically one actor in this book and in, in this, in this discussion, but the other, other actors that have adapted as well. Let's take this one step further. How are others adapting? And let's say, does do the do the Chinese see what's going on here, or the Iranians, or the North Koreans, or others who have um, preferences at odds with the U.S. or their neighbors or whatever? Are they going to run this playbook? And, and and is there a way to do that for them? So that they are aware of the playbook. I think their options to run the playbook are a little different. Um, Iran has run some variation of this in uh, Iraq for some time. Uh, it looks different on the ground, but it's a similar kind of mode of conventional threat from across the border, general purpose forces massing, you know, and then very low profile special forces teams or special cells as the, as the um, special groups, as the Iranians call them, and then local militias and uh, sort of penetration of the political system and creation of militia groups. Uh, I think Iraq is a special case, right? Because we did that to ourselves, we, mm-hmm. to be honest. Um, and I think uh, they've, some of the stuff they've done in Afghanistan is in a similar vein. They've had less success, um, more f- further afield. Although it's worth pointing out that the Iranians have had actually quite a lot of success in Latin America uh, and a few other places. Mm. So um, Iranians certainly trying to run a variant of it, but you know, different tools and a different um, set of adversaries. China's in very different circumstance. China's focused very heavily on completely non-military methods, um, you know, strategic real estate controls, acquisition of uh, commodities like rare earths and um, certain kinds of minerals, mm. the um, control of global supply chains, uh, manufacturing um, penetration, a lot of intellectual property theft. Right. The, I talk about this in the, um, in the book and I say that the Russians are running kind of a vertical maneuver, right? They're trying to flirt with that edge of detectability. The Chinese are going horizontal. They've gone outside the boundary of what we consider to be warfare. And the China chapter in the book is called conceptual envelopment because I argue that the Chinese approach has been to go outside the boundaries of our concept of what is war. Right. So that by the time we realize that what, what we're dealing with is part of a Chinese war fighting strategy, it's kind of too late. So, but, but that said, the Chinese and the Russians do exercise together militarily. They're fully aware of each other's um, uh, tactics and approaches. And actually the Chinese have a very close and longstanding relationship with uh, Iran as well. So there's a bit of cross-pollination for sure. There seems, and there are a couple of questions here about this. You talked about raising awareness of Russian behaviors to, to sort of put us, to shorten that, tighten up that decision window. And it, clearly any kind of operation like this, once it's seen time and time again, there's got to be diminishing returns to this. Um, what are the, you mentioned Russian learning. Where does, where does you know, Russian behavior go from here? Do you see their next step already? Yeah, uh, the Russians have put a lot of effort into conventional military modernization as a second track here. And I think from a Russian standpoint, they recognize that they're long-term, they're a declining power, right? For reasons of, you know, broader geopolitics. And what they're trying to do is carve out as much of a play space as they possibly can in, in the sort of sphere of influence so that they can, um, you know, have a, a buffer to, uh, to preserve their independence longer term. I think the way this long-term plays out has to do with the generational change in the Russian government. The people around Vladimir Putin largely drawn from Russian intelligence services and they operate 
in a way that would be very familiar to anyone that's familiar with how those services operate. That's a certain generation. Uh, it's going to change. Um, well, so they're former Soviets, most of them, right? Most of them were, K- I mean, KGB. Yeah. That's where they grew up anyway, as, as kids. Correct. Yeah, the vast majority of them are. There are other strands in Russian politics, right? There's been yeah. large-scale protests against uh, uh, corruption and inefficiency out in uh, Vladivostok in the east. Right. There's, you know, you, you would have seen Alexei Navalny was poisoned yeah. this week. Um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a, another strand here. And... I think as I talk about in the book where I go through the history, we also played a role in creating this monster because of the way that we treated Russia in the 1990s. And uh, when the Russians say, we're only doing to you what you've been doing to us for years, they're actually not wrong about that. Um, That doesn't justify anything they've done. It's worth pointing out that there's two sides of this story. And, uh, you know, I try to be fair in the book uh, about, seeing this from the Russian standpoint. I, I should also mention a classic Russian response when you talk about this with people from Russia is to say, look, this is a conspiracy theory. And if you'd ever spent five minutes in a room with a Russian bureaucrat, you would know that they're just totally incompetent and couldn't possibly do this. Couldn't possibly do this. <laughs> and I laugh about that because that's, that's what we say when the Russians say, you guys are running this incredibly sophisticated. Right. Yeah. Like, have you seen how the US government right. has, yes. you know, And it may be that we're all, we're all right about that, right? Maybe we're actually, yeah. uh, you know, what we talk about as a security dilemma, right? In international yeah. relations. Well, we're, we're seeing the Russians as running this incredibly sophisticated strategy and they're seeing us doing the same thing. And maybe we're all just, you know, a, a little bit less competent than we like to portray ourselves. That's a really funny approach. I mean, and, and actually it's a thought, thought experiment in, in, in that regard too, because conspiracy theories are, are best debunked by the assumptions of the coordination that must have been required to make them happen. Could right. possibly have happened. If you've right. ever been in a bureaucracy, you know, that's not how it works. Right. That's a, I think that's pretty funny myself. Yeah. And that's a, and I think that's the strongest Russian argument that none of this is actually true or only some of it is true is like, really, you know, go look at the, you know, the, the sewage system in Moscow and tell me that we can run, you know, yeah. but, you know, I mean, it's entirely possible that p- people can be both nefarious and incompetent at the same time. Right? Well, it's also, it's also important to understand the technology that's, that's available today that makes this actually much more effective in really small numbers, right? I mean, small right. numbers of people, it's all it's really required. Do we need big state bureaucracies to create these enormous monstrous armies, industrial age armies anymore? Right. Not in this situation. You need and, a much smaller coterie of folks working on it. Right. And in some ways, the Russian approach is a bit of a throwback to earlier eras. Like you've got almost like privateers running around. Oh, doing sure. Stuff. They do have privateers. Um, <laughs> you know, you, you've got these kind of like the Vostok Battalion is is a classic. It's like one of these Civil War regiments where, you know, Colonel Smith puts up the money <laughs> and then everyone buys their own horse, you know. It's yeah. that kind of, I mean, you know, these these are things that we don't still regard as normal, but there, there's nothing fundamentally, you know, um, uh, uh, ineffective about them. It's just not how we do business anymore. In fact, one of the things I do with my students, and I, I know you're aware of this, is we go through a list of like a hundred of these techniques that the Russians have done. And I ask guys to rule out from the list, anything that we would absolutely never do for ethical or legal reasons. And when you go through that and you say, well, that's illegal, that would be unethical. We wouldn't morally ever do this. It's actually a pretty short list, right? A lot of the things that the Russians do are open to us to do as well. We would do them, you know, under different legal frameworks and with different values set behind them. But I think the Russians are showing the way to lots of people, not just their allies, um, about how to operate in this new kind of much more ambiguous uh, information environment. All right. Interesting. Great. Well, we've run out of time. Uh, David, that was, that was great. That was fantastic. It, <clears throat> it's always enjoyed to talk with you. Uh, you have an incredible wealth of knowledge. The book is fantastic. It goes, to, I mean, I'm a theory guy. I love the theory section of it that kind of creates this new framework for understanding how this, how this all works. Um, but the case study and the amount of details that go into it, he's talk, he's got a great chapter on Iran, another great chapter on, on China. And, and like I said, uh, you, it, you, it's an enjoyable read too, because David's quite, uh, quite a writer as well. So I appreciate everybody's attention. David, thank you again for your time and hope to see yeah. you soon. Yeah, and check out the MAGS program at uh, ASU. It's great. And, and you get to have David, David Kukon as your professor. That's a pretty good deal. All right, buddy. We'll take All care right. of yourself and we'll see you next right. time. See you, mate.